Welcome everybody to Introduction to Deep Learning. This is the seventh lecture and today we're going to talk about loss functions and activations. In the previous lectures, we've been talking a lot about the optimization underneath. Uh, specifically, we've talked about monitoring our training and validation curves. We talked about um, how to set the hyperparameters, specifically the learning rate was one of the important things, um, and the respective implications on how the learning rate effectively affects the training process and the optimization process. Now, the main thing what we, on the bigger picture, what we were currently doing is we are looking still at this high level concept for machine learning, meaning that we have our training data, we have validation, we have test, um, and we try to basically optimize our function at training time. And we hope that it generalizes eventually with a relatively small generalization error that we have at the end of the day. Now, today we would like to continue that. We would like to continue specifically how this process can use certain parts. And specifically, we're going to talk about loss functions first, and then we're going to talk about the activations. So what we have seen so far, uh, we have seen basically, uh, we've talked a lot about the data points about our ground truth, right? Um, we talked a lot about our optimization procedures, like SGD optimizers and all these kind of variations. We talked a lot about uh, model parameters. We talked about labels and estimation. Um, and now what we want to do is we want to look at the loss functions a little bit in more detail and more specifically. Um, yeah, and then we're going to talk a bit about model parameters and best practices as well. Okay, so let's talk about outputs and loss functions of our network, right? So as we know, our network has an input layer, it has a bunch of hidden layers and it has an output layer. Each of these circles here are neurons and we know that all of these edges that connect the respective neurons are our weights. Um, and eventually our output layer based on a given input is going to make some prediction. Um, and now we have to judge this prediction and judging this prediction in practice for us means we're computing um, a loss function. Um, based on this loss function, we are going to compute a gradient through backpropagation and through backpropagation, we then update the respective network weights such that we get better or the desired predictions that we want for our respective problem. Now, the big question here is what is the shape of these loss functions? And we have already seen some of the loss functions, of course, um, but we haven't talked about it into too much detail. Now, let's start very basic. Um, so the basic loss functions we've talked about were regression losses. Um, we've, we've talked about this even before the concept of neural networks even was done, right? We talked about things like linear regression. And the core idea of a regression loss is typically you have, um, well, you have a floating point value that you want to predict and your network is going to make um, a certain prediction. You're comparing these two floating point values um, and then you're going to get uh, a number that tells you how far they are apart. And the basic way to compute this distance is you can either use an L1 or an L2 distance. Now, this is still following the same thing what we had before. We have here our training pairs, we have our input labels, uh, our input and our labels, we have X as our input, Y are our labels. Um, and then what we do is we simply we go over every sample um, that we have uh, and we compute the squared distance between the respective prediction, um, what our function predicts, and we squaring every value of our function. Now, um, the thing here is, for the sake of simplicity, uh, you could think about it in, in multiple ways. You have two dimensions you have to consider. One is the dimension uh, of the output. So you can have a higher dimensional output. Uh, that's basically like this difference here could be a higher dimensional output. Or you could also think about you have multiple samples, which is this i here, which is the i training pair respectively. Uh, and you also need to loop over these ones as well. Okay. So, and that's the thing what we are seeing here at the bottom right now. So now what we see here is we have one training pair, but each of these training pairs is a 16 dimensional vector, could be like a four by four image or something like this, right? Um, and then what you have to do is you have to compute the square difference and sum up all of these ones for this specific training sample, right? Um, and well, the way you're doing it is you're just computing the difference here, like uh, 12 minus 15 squared, right, is nine. Um, 24 minus 20 is 16. Uh, well, it's four squared, it's 16. Uh, 42 minus 40 
um, is two squared, which is four and so on, right? So this is how you're computing an L2 distance. Um, and it can be a single floating point value, of course, but it can also be a multidimensional vector depending on the respective problem you're solving, right? Um, for L1 losses, it's exactly the same thing. Um, the L1 losses just take the absolute difference. They don't use the square. Um, you can do the same thing here. Um, and then you just go for each of the outputs. You just sum up the respective differences, and then you're gonna get some output in our uh, loss function. And again, there's two things to consider here. You have two loops basically, right? One is the dimensionality of the output data and the other loop you have is uh, going over the respective number of training samples, which is depending dependent on how many um, uh, yeah, training samples you have in your current mini batch basically. Okay, so what's the difference between two, these two losses? Well, it's an L2 versus an L1 loss. Um, the L2 loss is the sum of the square differences. Sometimes when people tell you they have an SSD loss, they just mean an L2 loss, same thing. Um, the, the, the big downside of the L2 losses is that if you have one outlier, then they squaring this difference between those outliers. And that means it's very prone to these outliers, right? Which is kind of what you would expect from an L2 loss. Um, uh, the, the really good thing about the L2 loss, though, is they give you really nice gradients. It's not just gradient efficient, what's on the slide here, but it's also giving you very smooth gradients. It's a smooth function, basically. And so from a pure optimization standpoint, you would always want to uh, use an L2 loss. And by the way, this is not just something that you see in neural network land. You see this throughout many, many domains, in, for instance, in computer vision or so. Um, you see many, many times the difference being computed in L2 losses requires often some, some form um, of, of robust optimization as well afterwards. So L2 is great for optimization, right? It has a lot of properties that we would like to use for our optimizers, but you need to have some way of dealing with outliers. And typically dealing with outliers in the context of L2 means it's called some sort of a robust optimization and so on. Um, yeah, and the, the optimum is the mean, of course, right? That's just what the L2 loss gives you. If you're taking an L1 loss, however, this is the sum of absolute differences. This is much more robust to outliers because the cost of the outlier is just linear and doesn't like quadratically grow. Um, the optimization is a bit painful. Like, you know, you have to compute a gradient with respect to this function and it's not so nice, nice and smooth anymore. Uh, the optimum is the median. So again, even if you have an L1 loss, that is not part of a neural network of whatever optimization problem you're solving. Optimizing it is typically considered to be very costly and very hard. Um, so typically you have things like iterative reweighted linearly squares and stuff like this, how you solve L1 losses, and it's not that straightforward. I mean, you can still use SGD, uh, but you don't always have these nice properties um, that you would get from an L2 loss, right? So these are the, the, the two things that we have to, to keep in mind when we're choosing L1 or L2 respectively. Um, and this counts, of course, for neural networks as well, because all we're doing here is we're running a, a gigantic gradient descent optimizer um, with stochastic sampling, of course, but um, we still have to compute gradients and that is easier with L2, but L2 has outliers um, and this is the trade-off we have to deal with eventually. Okay, so this is a regression. Now, we talked a little bit about classification. Uh, the one way what we talked about specifically was actually binary classification. So in this case, we only have two classes. Um, in these two classes, um, we either have a label of zero and one, right? These are our ground truth labels. That's all that we can have in a, in a training pair. Uh, our training pair still has some input and our label here is either zero or one. Now, in contrast to what we have seen before, for a binary classifier, our output is going to be always, um, well, it's always two classes, right? That's all we can do. We can either predict this class or that class. Okay, so how does it work in practice when we're doing binary classification? Well, binary classification is a direct um, derivative of the sigmoid function. So what we say is, well, we're taking our inputs. This is our inputs. The inputs, again, can be very high dimensional, like an image, right? Um, and on this input, we have our, uh, we multiply each of the input variables uh, with our weight variables. So we have 
the input of the ith training sample is d dimensional and then we have d weights that are multiplied with the respective inputs here uh, we're summing those ones up and we're gonna get a score here right this is just linear this is just a linear layer here right that's that's all what it is so this linear layer takes the input it multiplies it and it gets a score of course you can have still many hidden layers but for the sake of simplicity we're gonna ignore those ones right now now in this S here, this is now the score of class one. This means that, oh, if our crown truth label is one, um, this is our score that we get in order to support that label. Now, what we would love to do is, we would love to have a probability that says us, what's the probability that this loss here, or sorry, that this score is referring to class one or not? Well, and this is what the sigmoid function is doing for us because it's taking the score and it's literally squashing it between zero and one, right? So the sigmoid function, as we know, it can be between zero and one and it has this nice, nice smooth property. So we go one over one plus e to the power of minus the score function. And this is then the probability of the output that this class here is the respective prediction, right? Um, and this is what we want to do. And the nice thing about the sigmoid is because it has the squashing function that it that it uh, maps between zero and one uh, means that the sigmoid can actually be interpreted as a probability. So what's the probability of this class to be one or not one, right? So in other words, if this is more than 50% here, then we would say, well, this is class one. And if it's lower than 50%, we would say, well, it's not class one. And since this is a binary classification problem, we can either we can say it's either that or that respectively. Yeah, that's all sigmoid. Um, we've seen this, of course, right? We should, this should be very familiar to us by now. Um, and what we would like to do now is, uh, we would like to compute the whole thing at once. Well, and we can do that very easily. So what we do now is we literally go ahead and take our linear layer here. This is our score function S here, this part here. Uh, and we can just put this in here, right? This is just, this sum here is just the linear layer, which is just, uh, the dot product between the inputs times the respective weights here. Okay, that probably would be a bias as well. Um, but this is something we're feeding in here. This is our score. And then the sigmoid squashes it between zero and one. Uh, and then we have a probability uh, distribution that we're getting out of it. If the probability is greater than 50%, then we say, oh, this is class one. Otherwise we say it's not class one. And this is just binary, right? It just says yes or no as an output. Now the question is, can we go ahead and um, channelize that one and make sure this can be done for multi-class classification? And this is what's called a softmax. Um, we'll later get to the name what it means, why it's called a softmax. Um, but the idea now is, instead of having just one class, we have an arbitrary amount of classes. It's always the same number of classes, but like from the problem standpoint, it can be a very large number of classes, it can be a thousand or so. And the difference right now is here in, in practice, we have here C classes, so one to C. So we have more ground truth label that we can actually predict. Well, what do we want to do now is, well, we would like to expand this linear layer here first. And we would say, well, we're just going ahead and we are now computing a single score for each of the classes. Well, how do we do that? The input is always the same, right? So this is our input, our D-dimensional input. And now what we do is we just say we have for each class, we have a set of weights that correspond to the respective classes, right? So we have here these K classes. So we have K set of weights, each of them producing a score function for one of the respective classes. Um, so now let's be more specific. Let's just say we want to know the probability of one specific class. So let's call this the, the the score function of the kth class. That's what we care about, right? So we want to know is if our yi is equal to k, this is our kth class, this score function we care about right now. And we would like to know, is that the label that we're predicting based on that score? And what we want to do is we want to now figure out a way how to model this as a probability distribution. So we want to know the probability of the class k um, given the respective core function s of k that we have just predicted. And what we need to know is we need to know a function here that works 
as a probability distribution. And this is what the softmax function is. Um, so the softmax function now goes ahead and says, take weights for each class, theta one, theta two, theta three, right? These are a set of weights. This is theta, zero, uh, theta one. Uh, this here is theta two. And this here is theta three. This produces the three scores for each of the classes. Again, same thing what we have seen here, just this whole thing here three times. Okay, so we have three scores right now. And now what we want to do is we want to check out the softmax function that takes these three scores here as input and maps it to a probability distribution for each of the respective classes. So what's, um, well, what's, uh, What's the probability for each of the classes indi individually? Now, if you take just the first class, um, the soft function looks like that. So what you do here is you say, given the probability that we're predicting the label from the first class, given the set of weights that correspond uh, to the network here. Okay. And what we do here is we ex we channelizing the, the, the sigmoid function now and say, oh, it's now e to the power of the score here for this first class. And then we normalize it by all the other classes, right? And the idea is that basically we are modeling a probability distribution. And the idea of a probability distribution is that if we're summing all of these ones up here, then they should sum up to one, right? And this is what's happening here. So now we just have three output predictions. And we need to know that if you're summing these three here up, then this one sums up to one. And this is how the function is designed, right? So the function, these ones are just normalization factors that say if we're summing up all of these individual ones, they sum up to one. Now, what I would actually like to do, I would, and now that the question is why is here an exponential function? Well, what I would like to do actually is um, I would like to design a function such that when this label here is predicted, this one is just one and everything else is just going to be zero. If this function here predicts the right one here, then this one is one and everything else is zero and so on. Now, the big problem though is if you're doing it the way I described it, this would be a maximum function, right? You just take the maximum score that you're predicting, you take that score and you say, that's the right class you just predicted. Now, the problem is if you're taking a maximum function, it's not a smooth function anymore, right? And this is why this is a softmax function. So the softmax says, well, it's close to a maximum function. We are approximating this maximum with this exponential function that is close to it, but it still has smooth gradients that we can plug into our gradient descent solver, and we can have a smooth optimization with good results at the end of the day. Um, by the way, one thing you're going to see again as a kind of like overarching scheme of this lecture here is, Everything we're going to do right now is designed to get good gradients. Good gradients means we can optimize it with our SGT solver. That means we can train our network very efficiently. And that means we can get good uh, and scalable network architectures we eventually can uh, use to make very, very good predictions. And we can do a lot of good learning, right? So again, to reiterate the, the concept here of the softmax, we need this normalization here that says, well, if you sum up all the probabilities of the different classes, um, they're going to be summing up to one. And the next thing what we want to do is we want to approximate this maximum function with a soft max function. Um, and the function that is the closest to it is this is exponential function, right? It has a very steep fall off, but it is still smooth. And this is the reason why people use it in practice. Okay. Uh, now what we can do is we can basically take these linear layers here and can put them here respectively into this one. This is all what's happening here, right? This is just X I is the input here. Uh, dot product with theta one, this one is dot product with theta two and theta three. Uh, and then you just normalize respectively, right? So this is our softmax right now. Now, of course, this is an example right now where we have three classes, but the softmax of course generalizes to an arbitrary amount of classes. Um, so instead of having just three, we just have a sum here. So what does it mean? Well, we have the we have this normalization that goes over all the classes right now. We have e to the power of the score function of the respective class. This is the this is the same fun this is the same normalization factor that we use for all of the output classes. And this is the respective score that we feed into this exponential function 
of the specific class where we have the respective ground truth label, right? So this is the probability that we're predicting class yi, given the input xi, and given our network weights theta respectively, right? Um, yeah, so note that this is the theta here. This theta is all of the thetas, right? Um, and then, yeah, and then we're feeding it just in here. So we have e to the power of xi times theta yi. We are normalizing it with e to the power of xi times theta k, and we're just iterating over all the theta k's, right? So all of the set of weights that we have for each of the respective classes we're just feeding in here, we're normalizing it, and that's all we're going to do. And this theta here is actually the set of all class weights, uh, of all, yeah, of all class weights eventually, right? Okay, so we have C classes, we have S as the score of the respective class, and now what we have is we have a function um, that is um, generalizable. Right? So we have these two parts here, we have the exponential operation, this probability here is always going to be greater than zero. It has this approxim approximative property of the maximum function, but with a smooth fall off, right? It falls off very sharply. It's always greater than zero, um, but it's a, it's, a, it's a smooth fall off. And then this normalization makes sure our probabilities sum up to one respectively. Now this is the softmax function. And as a little bit of a spoiler, the softmax function is the default function what everybody uses for classification problems. This is, this is the main function what all the state-of-the-art networks are using today, and there is a couple of reasons for it. Well, um, one reason, for instance, for it is the numerical stability. Um, when we're talking about numerical stability, what we mean is, oh, we're having a bit of an issue here with respect to this s here. Right, so S is like something a bit smaller, something a bit higher. So if you're having a bit of a um, numerical stability, you will notice that the softmax is actually quite numerically stable. Like if you have some deviation in the inputs here, uh, this is something you can prove for yourself, but the, the softmax is actually very, very nice to that. Okay, now there's one little detail that I ignored so far. So at the moment, this is not actually the loss we're computing. At the moment, what we're actually computing is just the probabilities. We're just saying, what is this probability that we're getting here as an output? Now we still need a mechanism how we go from the output probability to an actual loss function. And this is something we've already looked at. Um, we know how that works. All we're doing is we're taking the maximum likelihood estimate, meaning we take the negative logarithm of the probabilities. Um, and this is called the cross entropy loss. Right. Um, so sometimes people are a bit confused when they say softmax versus cross entropy. This is actually the same thing, except that the, the cross entropy, technically speaking, m refers to taking the maximum likelihood of the softmax probabilities. And this is what we're getting here then, right? So we're getting the negative log of e to the power of s of yi. And then we're dividing this one with the sum over all e to the power of s of k, right? So this is a normalization. And this is the respective soft max of the respective classes. Yeah, and this is the standard loss that everybody is using in practice for multi-class classification problems. So this is quite an important uh, function you need to have a look at. And what I would recommend is actually um, play around a little bit with it. Um, you know, write your own like graph plot in Python or so, and feed in a bunch of values and check out how this function actually behaves. Because this is actually, it's kind of remarkable and it's kind of nice. Um, so let's have a look at one example actually. So let's have an example of an image classification problem. So we're having, let's say, a three-way classifier. Uh, so we have three training examples and we have three classes. And what we would love to do, we would like to go ahead and apply our cross entropy here on training uh, our neural network for these three classes here. Okay, so we have a score function. Our score function is based on our neural network. It's f of xi of theta. So theta are the neural network weights. xi are the respective input images. Um, and f is our network, right? Um, in this case, our network is just a linear layer. So we just have a dot product between those two. And um, what we would love to do is we have given a function with the weights here. This is our network. We have the training pairs. We would like to optimize for our parameters 
theta for the weights and the biases. In this case, we have no biases. Technically, there's like a bias should come here um, with C classes. But the thing that we would like to look at right now is actually our loss functions right now. So how do we compute the loss? Well, uh, let's just assume we have a bunch of weights in here. That is how this network is initialized. So let's say our theta is currently given. Uh, based on our theta, we can compute the respective scores S. So let's compute this part here first. And for the sake of simplicity, I'm just going to make some numbers up here. So let's just say these are the scores we're getting, right? So we have for this image of the cat here, um, we're going to get three scores because it's a three way classifier. We have one score that is associated to the cat class. We have one score that is associated to the chair class. And we have one score that is associated to the car class. The cat class here gets you a 3.2 score, the chair class gets you a 5.1 score, and the car class gets you a minus 1.7 score. So assuming this was just quote unquote a one layer neural network, um, that would mean that in this case, all we had been doing, we just have one set of, uh, one set of parameters theta here. Um, based on this parameter theta here, um, we multiplying the thetas with the respective pixels of the images, and this is how we obtained these scores. Um, I just made them up right now. These are not actual scores, right? Um, but let's just pretend that these are actual scores. Um, they are just predicted. We do the same thing here for the next one. Um, same thing, we're feeding in the pixels of this chair class here. We're multiplying the pixels with the respective parameters theta here. We're gonna get 1.3, 4.9, 2.0 as the respective scores for our three classes because we have three sets of weights theta. And we do lot the same thing for this car image here. We're going to get 2.2, 2.5, and minus 3.1, right? So again, important here is to know how these scores could have been produced. And they could have been produced by having three different weight sets. One weight set for the cat, one weight set for the chair, one weight set for the car. We're multiplying our weights respectively with the pixels of the input. And this is the scores that we're getting, right? So we have three training samples. We have three classes. That means we have in total three by three is equal to nine um, different scores that we're getting here. Okay, but what do we want to do right now? We want to have an example and we would like to compute our cross entropy loss, right? Um, well, how do we compute our loss? Um, well, here's our loss, right? Li is equal to the negative logarithm of the softmax here. Um, so this i here, you always see when there's an i, i always means, well, this is the number of samples. So just always keep this dimensionality in mind. Here we have three samples, one, two, three. So we're gonna compute three losses, right? Um, so let's compute the loss for the first one here, for the first training sample. Um, for the first training sample, what we do is we take our scores for this cute cat. Um, and what we do is we're feeding into this function here. So we are, computing e to the power of 3.2 and then we're dividing it by the sum of e to the power of 3.2 plus e to the power of 5.1 plus e to the power of minus 1.7 and we are splitting this one up into a compute graph right now so we're first taking this exponent here which is this part at the top so that's e to the power of the respective scores here. Then we're normalizing it, we're dividing it by the sums here, and this is what we're getting. Um, and then we're taking the negative logarithm, and this is what we're getting here as an output. Note, however, that these values that are rounded, like the logarithm of zero would be a bit problematic here. Um, and so what we are getting basically is this as an output. Okay, so now this is our loss these are our loss values that we computed, but we only need one of the three values. And why do we know that? We only need the value of the respective ground truth class. So we just want to know what is the loss, like how far away am I from my ground truth class? And my ground truth class is this one at the top. It knows, oh, this was a cat label. So cat label says, just keep this one around for the cat. So we only care about this one and we don't need these two here. So we just care about how close are we to the cat? Did we make a cat prediction in our function? And in this case, we're like, nah, maybe not that much, right? So we're a little bit further away here. 
And if you're a little bit further away here, that means, oh, yeah, okay, that losses should be probably pretty high. Um, and in this case, our loss is 2.04, which is considered to be relatively high. This is the loss here. So if I feed in this image, my cross entropy loss tells me I have a loss of 2.04. And the reason why it's a relatively high loss is because the predictions of these scores was not ideal. Um, because, you know, the cat would have been, should have had a higher score and everything else should have had a lower score, right? Okay, uh, now we're just going to do the same thing for the other ones. Um, let's just say we're going to get this is a 0 0.079 score. Um, you see this loss here is lower, uh, which kind of makes sense because the score here for the chair was higher. So this one predicted kind of the correct label. Um, and here we're predicting the car is a minus 3.1. That's like totally worse. So this loss is even higher than the ones we had before, right? So. If the loss function don't correspond to the ground truth labels that we have, then we unfortunately making um, wrong, uh, then we're making wrong predictions. And because we're making wrong predictions, our loss functions will be high respectively. Okay, so now we have three individual losses. These are the three Li that we have. And now what we need to do is we need to just sum them all up together. So L is equal to the sum of the Li's. We normalize it. So it's L1 plus L2 plus L3 divided by three. That's what we're doing here. And this is our respective output of our classification problem, right? So what we're doing is we're doing this on the entirety of the data set or on the entirety of our mini batch. Then we're getting a loss value, computing gradients, and then we're iterating. Okay, now this is the softmax packaged up um, with the cross entropy. Um, now, there's a few other loss functions that we would like to look at, and we would like to compare, um, and eventually I would like to convince you why the cross entropy is so good and why everybody is using it. So another alternative choice is the hinge loss. Um, it's also called an SVM loss. Um, so people who know SVMs, they notice this immediately. Um, that's another way how to do a, a multi-classification problem. Um, so you start at the same premise here. We have a score function S. This S is computed by having a function F, which is dependent on the input and the parameters theta. So we just have this dot product here. Presumably, there could also be a bias here, right? Um, and then the hinge loss, what it does is, the hinge loss basically goes, it goes as follows. Um, it's not a soft max, it's an actual max here. Um, it says, go over, basically compute the difference between my ground truth score, sorry, compute the difference between the score of my ground truth class and the respective other classes. And what I would like to do is, I would like to go and compare all of them individually, right? So let's make this more concrete. So now let's take the same sample with the same scores that we had before. And now instead of using a softmax, we're applying this hinge loss that we had just seen. So this hinge loss here again, it's like this sum where k is not equal to the yi label and we're just computing the differences from the current score with respect to the ground truth class score um, and we are summing this one up and this is our loss at the end of the day so if you're doing this um well first of all how many how many entries do we have in the sum well we have two of them because two of them are not, like the, they have one label that is the ground truth label and i have two other ones so i have two um, parts of my sum that I need to sum up. So what I need to do is now I need to check the scores. I need to basically take this 5.1 minus 3.2. That's 5.1 minus the 3.2. And then in the second round of the sum, I need to go minus 1.7 minus 3.2. And that's what's happening here, right? So my, my hinge loss here is 5.1, which is this one minus 3.2 plus 1, maximum of 0. And here I take minus 1.7 minus 3.2 plus 1, right? So you notice this SYI is always the 3.2 and this SK is either that one or that one respectively, right? And if we're doing this, we're getting this as an output here. So we're getting here a maximum of 0 and 2.9. So that's already positive. So it's 2.9 uh, plus the maximum of 0 and minus 3.9, which is maximum here, right? So this is 0 
so it's 2.9. So what does it tell us? Well, the hinge loss does basically nothing else but compares the scores between all the classes. So it does this pairwise comparison, right? So it compares this score here, the car score versus the cat score. And it says, well, okay, my cat score is already larger than my car score. And my loss says, well, that's great. I'm happy with that because it's actually a cat, right? So compared to the car, my cat prediction is actually winning. So this is why the loss here for this pair is actually zero. If I'm comparing the chair pair and says 5.1 minus 3.2, that one, unfortunately, is not there yet. That means um, it's uh, unfortunately it should have been a higher score for the cat, but it wasn't. So this is a score that it will be greater than zero. And this plus one here, what of the end of the day is, is kind of the expectation what we have, right? So it, it optimizes this until there's a difference that is larger than one. And it's kind of this normalization bias what you have here. Uh, there's a bunch of mathematical reasons behind it. Uh, I don't want to go into all of this, but think about it as it's kind of like a bias by one, basically, right? Um, okay. And what you can see here is for this pair, we're happy. For the other pair, we're not happy. So this gives us a loss of 2.9. And we have to figure out how to make this loss smaller. So this is in our evaluation says, oh, it's not that great for this pair. Okay, and now we're computing the other one. For this one, it's very obvious. You see it already that this is a good one because um, if this one is 4.9 and it's more than one larger than all the other ones, you know that this, that this hinge loss will be zero. It's very obvious because that's what it is, right? It just computes the pairwise differences. If this is already so much larger than the other ones, then this loss is just zero. And here, well, here this, this is also not good, right? This is too small. So we're seeing here the respective differences are actually relatively large, right? Okay, here, here was the function. Maybe we should go quickly go over it, right? Pairwise comparison, 1.3 minus 4.9 plus one. This is zero. Um, and here the same thing, 2.0 minus 4.9 plus one. This is uh, going to be minus 1.9. So maximum of zero is zero. And this one is zero. Now, and for the last one, we will see, okay, this is a very small score, but it should have been a much higher score. So now here it's like 2.2 minus, <laughs> minus 3.1 plus one. So this is a very high value at 6.3, right? 6.3 is high. And then 2.5 minus, minus 3.1 plus one, it's 6.6. .6. And then if you're adding it up, that's also relatively high value at the end. Okay, and then finally, we have to compute the total loss, which is the sum of all of these three samples. So we have 2.9 plus 0 plus 12.9. This is this one here. So three losses, we average it divided by three, and then our total loss is 4.3. Okay, so this is the hinge loss. And now, the reason, the main reason why we wanted to introduce it is actually to make a comparison and make the softmax shine. Um, so if you're comparing these two, we have this hinge loss and we have the uh, cross entropy loss and we would like to compare the two. So now assuming now we have an image that is fixed and we want to make a certain class prediction here, but we have three models that we would like to evaluate according to these two losses. So let's say we have an example like this one. So here we have a model one, we have a model two and I have a model three. Uh, these are just presumably our scores that these models produce for these three classes. So this model one produces five, minus three, and two. This model two produces five, 10, 10, and this model three produces five, minus 20, minus 20. Okay, so what do we want now is we want to make sure um, this model predicts the correct class. So for the correct class, uh, this should be uh, yi should be zero. So the zeroth class should be the highest meaning that we hope that the score here at the beginning should be pretty high. Now, what we can see is between these three models, um, all of the models predict, uh, like predict different stuff, basically. So here if it says five minus three and two. This one says, well, this is the highest score. So I assume presumably that's the right class. That seems good. So here it's five, 10, 10. Here the five is not the highest score, meaning that this would predict the wrong class. And this one here is five minus 20 minus 20. This would again predict the right class. Okay. Now, this is what we would like to capture with our losses now, right? We would like to say, well, this one is basically the 
the model three, objectively speaking, is the best model, right? It makes the highest prediction for the right class and the lowest prediction of the scores for the wrong classes, right? This one is not great and this one is okay-ish, I guess, right? Okay, so the hinge loss, if you're computing it, which is, we just compute the differences between losses and n1. So it's minus three, minus five plus one is zero, right? Because that's the highest class and there's a difference that is larger than one to all of the other ones. Um, and then here, yeah, it's two minus five plus one is also zero because this is negative. So this loss here is zero. Um, for the model two, where we having five, 10, 10, it says 10 minus five plus one, it's pretty high. 10 minus five plus one is also pretty high. So we're getting six and six respectively here. So this is 12, so this is a high loss. This, this loss here correctly assesses that this model prediction was not good because our scores were not correctly distributed. Um, and then model three says, well, minus 20 minus five plus one is very negative, so this is good. And minus 20 minus five plus one also here is very negative, so this is also zero. So we have two zeros here. Um, and we see that basically the hinge law says, well, this model is good and this model is good and this model is bad, which to some degree is true, so this is nice. The only downside now of the hinge loss is that these two models, they are not being evaluated differently. Um, this model is in a sense making a better prediction because the difference between the losses of the wrong and the right class are larger versus here they're relatively small. So apparently model three is better, but the losses show no difference between model one and model three because both of these losses are zero. Right, and that's what the hinge loss does. This is just how the hinge loss is computed. So when a hinge loss reaches a model that makes these kind of predictions, it would not try to improve it anymore. It would not like give you a gradient to go here. It would just get stuck here, which you know could be okay, but it it doesn't change it. When we comparing it with the cross entropy loss, I'm not going to go through all the computations right now. Um, but these are the results between these two. So this one is roughly uh, 0.05, and this one is two times 10 to the power of minus 11. So obviously this one here is a much, much lower number. Um, so this model here clearly has a smaller loss and that means the the cross entropy loss would favor this model here at the bottom way more over model one here. Despite both make right predictions, but this one makes tries to maximize the gap even further, right? Like it gets harder to do it because it has this exponential function, but it tries, it still gives you a gradient. It still tries to improve it more and more as you keep going right so the cross entropy loss always wants to improve the loss is never zero it cannot reach zero because it's this exponential function um and the hinge loss however uh separates right oh yeah don't if you're getting a loss of zero um with the cross entropy something might be wrong <laughs> okay so yeah this is like the motivation why the softmax and the cross entropy is is superior to the hinge loss, right? It still tries to further improve the respective loss. Um, and um, this is why most people are using it in practice. Okay, so these are the two main loss functions for classification. Uh, let's talk about the loss in a compute graph now. So how does it look like? Well, uh, we do want to go ahead and combine the loss function with weight regularization. And we would like to optimize the parameters of a network according to multiple losses simultaneously, right? We could have multiple losses. It's a thing we're actually gonna see later on. It's gonna be multitask learning um, that might be very beneficial for certain things. And we have to figure out how to do this in, in the relation to the compute graph. But this is the nice part about the compute graph. It's very modular in a sense, right? So this is our compute graph. We're having here our input data, we're having our labels, we're having our network parameters theta. Based on theta and x, we're gonna get our scores. Again, this could be a one layer thing. This could be a many, many n layer thing. Um, we have i training samples. Like you see, the, the reason why the slide is designed like this, we have many inputs, we have many labels. So we run this function many, many times. We have one set of theta here for all of the training samples. Um, and then we compute our loss function respectively. Um, we add probably some regularization, such as this is a weight, regular, weight regularizer here. Uh, we're adding these ones two up together and then we're getting our full loss. And what we want to do is we want to figure out our optimal theta 
weights um, with respect to all of these inputs and with respect to all of these losses. Yeah, so we do, well, we have a compute graph. We do our same thing. We compute the gradient with respect to theta. We apply SGD um, via back, well, we have, sorry. <laughs> we, um, we compute the gradient of theta We're using back propagation to compute the gradient and then we're running our gradient descent solver. Okay, now if you're summing, uh, if you're looking at all of these kind of things together, um, we have expanded the whole thing by, um, yeah, another indirection in a sense. Uh, so now we have our score functions, we have our loss functions, such as cross entropy and SVM. Um, we have various regularizers, we talked about this one already. We have an L2 regularizer, for instance, like which is just try to make sure our weights are small. Um, and then we have the full loss, which is just summing this one up. And yeah, and then we, uh, we just compute our loss, we compute our gradients, and then we do update steps. Okay. Um, so let's have another example here, regularization SVM loss. Um, so we have here our multi-class SVM loss. We have our full loss, which is taking SVM plus our regularizer here. Uh, we have here L1 and L2 respectively, what we can try out. Um, we have here our examples again. This is our input vector, which is just one, one, one. One set of weights is one, zero, zero, zero. The other weights is 0 0.25, 0 0.25, 0 0.25, 0 0.25, 0 0.25. Uh, what we're doing is we're computing our respective outputs. We say um, xt times w, um, it's just this times that gives you a 1 as a score. Uh, x times w2 also gives you a 1 as a score. This is how these weights are defined. And now the idea is if you're applying different regularizers, we're also going to prefer one or the other one, right? So if you're applying here uh, a weight regularization here that says our regularizer here says um, uh, this one gives you a one, um, and this one, so it's one squared plus one squared plus one squared plus one squared, and so on. Um, and actually, this is wrong, right? This should be four. Uh, this should be either average or both. There's a little issue here, but I guess you get the point, right? So this one here is higher because this is one. Sorry, no, it's all good. It's one squared plus zero squared plus zero squared plus zero squared is one. And this one here is 0.25 squared plus 0.25 squared plus 0.25 squared plus 0.25 squared. This is 0.25. Now I got it right. Um, and this is 0.25. So this loss here of the first one here is significantly higher with this regularizer um, because this L2 regularizer wants to make sure it distributes the weights equally. And now if we're adding, um, adding this one up here, which means, well, we're having this one's a regularizer. We have one plus. Uh, we have both regularizers. We would get this as a result here. Right. So this is just an example here, how you can now combine regularizers with SVM or uh, cross entropy losses. And you can see how this is being computed then in the compute graph respectively. Okay. So that's what I wanted to talk about for the loss function so far. I think the most important thing is that we can actually channelize the binary cross entropy to multiple classes. This is really critical for you to remember. Um, and the other thing what's critical is like, how can we combine these two ideas in a compute graph? Like, we have regularizers, we have um, loss functions, for instance, for the classification, and we can combine these. Okay, now let's move on um, to the next topic. Um, the next topic we would like to talk about is activations. So we, we talked about the activations already a little bit, um, although we didn't go into a lot of detail why we're choosing certain activations and Actually, what's kind of interesting from a historic standpoint, why did certain activations succeed and why do modern neural networks look like how they look like? Okay, so what do we do here? Well, um, we have our neural network, right? We have here our input here, we're getting here our respective uh, scores. Um, and we have here our like activation functions, our nonlinearities that we that we're introducing. Right? Okay. Um, so how does it look? Well, from a neuron's perspective, this looks like this. So we have here our input to this neuron, we have our weights for this neuron, we sum those ones up, and then this output here is being fed into our activation function, and then you're getting a respective output after the activation, um, what our neuron is activating. Okay, so 
um, what do we want to do here? Well, um, we would first try the simplest activation what we talked about. Well, actually not the simplest one, but the one we talked about most recently was the sigmoid function. Um, and this was actually a function that people used for, for quite a while. Um, 80s and 90s, people used sigmoid functions and they thought sigmoid is a very good function. Um, the reason why people thought sigmoid is a very good function for neural networks was um, the output is always normalized between 0 and 1. And that's kind of nice property to have because that means your network is rarely to, to explode, right? You're not going to get like crazy large numbers that suddenly explode the whole thing in the networks. And that's why people thought, well, sigmoid is great. Sigmoid is also great because it's differentiable everywhere. It doesn't have any discontinuities. You can compute gradients very easily and you can even compute it analytically, right? So that's why people thought, well, sigmoid sounds like a very reasonable choice as a nonlinearity. Now, sigmoid functions um, have these two nice advantages, right? They're normalizing and they have smooth gradients. They have one little disadvantage though, and this is a disadvantage we want to look at right now. So what we have to do is, right, when we want to go ahead and computing the partial derivatives, um, if you're going over our our weights, right, this is just this is just the linear derivative here. That's very easy. Um, but now when we're going over our derivative of our sigmoid here, um, well, we have an analytic function for that. That's also easy. Um, and the only issue what we have right now with our sigmoid is. Um, depending on the input values, I'm going to be at different parts of this function here. And this function here plateaus here at some point, right? So the gradients here in the middle, they're a lot larger than the gradients that are here on the outside of the sigmoid, which, which makes sense, right? That's how we designed the function. We use this exponential function here in the sigmoid um, to make sure we squash it between 0 and 1. That's the whole purpose of the sigmoid. But the problem basically is if we're taking a value here, this gradient will be small, meaning that this gradient will be small. And since all of these gradients will be small, um, our neuron is, we call this saturated. So saturated means we have uh, too large of an input to our, to our activation, um, such that our sigmoid gives a gradient that is relatively small or close to zero, right? Um, and this happens also on the other side here, of course, right? This happens in both directions. If a very large or a very small value, then the sigmoids have a little bit of an issue, right? So the problem with that is basically that the quote-unquote active region is only in the middle here. So um, now you can guess why this is tricky. So originally, you know, I said the sigmoid is kind of nice. This normalizes in every layer. So yes, it does that. But in the back pass, you have this challenging issue. You have to make sure that your predictions are basically in this middle regime here. Otherwise, your neuron is kind of dying out. It's just not getting you a good gradient. And if it doesn't have a good gradient, um, you, you can optimize, right? You can optimize a large network. And the bottom line is with the sigmoids, they actually work relatively okay as activations for small neural networks, because then this balance of like figuring out a nice initialization is not so tricky. However, if you're having a very large neural network, then you're going to get a thing called vanishing gradients, meaning that, you know, sometimes the initializations are not perfect. And then your, your sigmoid kind of like gets these vanishing gradients and then uh, your optimizer doesn't know what to do anymore. Right, and that's that's a big issue with the sigmoids, actually, right? Um, so you have to be very, very careful how to initialize the sigmoids, otherwise it doesn't optimize anymore. Um, and for large networks, that's practically not possible. And this is one of the reasons, I mean, there's many reasons, like compute is obviously another one, but this is one of the reasons when people designed these sigmoid networks, they couldn't scale it to larger networks, or it was very tricky to scale it to larger networks. Okay, there's another thing, though, with the sigmoids that is kind of important to notice. So one thing is that the outputs here, they're always going to be positive. And so I'm like, yeah, why is it a big deal? I mean, um, isn't it great when it's always positive? It's like, yeah, when the sigma output provides a positive input for the next layer. Now, what's the disadvantage here? Well, um, that means um, we are not zero centered, meaning the input of the next layer is always going to be greater than zero, right? So if we want to now compute a gradient here with respect to the weights, what happens is now 
the data is going to be either positive or negative. And the challenge is, if that happens, like you forcing an update for all the weights that go either all positive or all go negative. And again, the reason why that happens is because the sigmoid output is not zero centered. Like you cannot have some of the outputs that is smaller and larger. They are either going to be all greater than zero or all greater or smaller than zero that you have to correct them afterwards. And that's the challenge what you're getting here, right? So you're having this, this like chain rule, right? So if x1 is greater than zero and x2 is greater than zero. So this part here in the middle though, which is based on our sigmoid activations, right? Um, is either going to be positive or negative then. And that's the problem. Um, why is it a problem? Well, the problem is in the path the optimization goes. So since W1 and W2 can only be decreased or decreased at the same time, right? You're doing one update step for both. Um, you go and decrease both of them or you decrease both of them. So, sorry, you increase both of them or you decrease both of them. Uh, so you, you're getting this funny zigzag pattern. So the updates are either here or the updates are either there. Either both are positive or both are negative, but you can't be in this other diagonal. So the hypothetical path here you can get is like the staircase function. You get the zigzag path. Um, and this is a disadvantage of the sigmoid function because of this positive output. So this is why you need zero center data. Um, so, and by zero center data, I don't just mean the input data to be zero centered. I would love to have an activation function that zero centers also the respective activations from the previous layer and don't output all these positive numbers. And so the question is, can we find a function that looks like the sigmoid, but is actually zero centered? And the function that is the closest to that is the, the 10H function. Looks like that, roughly. <laughs> um, okay, so that function goes from minus one to plus one, and it is zero centered, so it solves the zigzagging problem, so it has certain advantages there. Um, however, it still has the saturation issue. So the gradients here and the gradients there, they're actually gonna be still pretty, pretty much close to zero, right? And because they're close to zero, uh, that means uh, we can get vanishing gradients and because of the vanishing gradients um, This might be a small little issue if you're having large networks um, And actually in practice, this is not a not an ideal <laughs> visualization here in practice The 10h goes more like this and it saturates actually pretty harshly um, And this is a reason why 10h um, Yeah, was also a bit challenging, but what people figured out right so in the 80s 90s people used a lot of sigmoids and then in the End of 90s, 2000s, they started using 10H because at least at least it solved the zero standard issue and had better properties for the optimization. Um, but it turns out this vanishing gradient thing is still an issue there um, and it still doesn't allow you to get to very, very large networks. Okay. Um, yeah. And how do we fix it? Well, this is now the age of reloads. And you see, this was this famous paper by Alice Kruszewski. It was 2012. Um, this paper um, uses a very simple function, just uses this maximum function. And this is the function we used for the most part already as our example function. Um, and it's a really simple function actually. All it does, it takes the maximum, but it is a nonlinearity. Um, but it has two nice properties. It has, in this part here, it has very, very nice gradients. It doesn't saturate at all, right? Um, it's large and consistent gradients. That's all that we care about. The whole point of choosing activations is kind of making it as independent of initializations and optimization properties um, to still get good gradients to change it accordingly and fit it to the training set, right? That's the whole point of our optimization. So large and consistent gradients, doesn't saturate, fast conversions, all good. Now, there's a small little issue with the relu. A small little issue. So what happens if a really outputs a zero? Well, if you are outputting a zero, um, your function will be zero, right? Like that, that's just what it is. Now the challenge is if you're taking a gradient of that function in any of this part here, um, you don't get a very good gradient. In other words, you get no gradient at all. And this is an issue of what people call the dead reload problem, right? So dead reload problem means is if my neuron at some point produces negative outputs, it's not getting your gradient anymore and it cannot recover anymore. It's kind of this dead end. 
Um, so what you have to think about here is like the optimization, how it works is you have a big network with a lot of reloads. You're optimizing through this optimization, you're changing the parameters and here and there, you're going to get a bunch of reloads that are going to die off. So like the optimization of a relo based network is actually a one way process. You cannot take an existing network and try to take a conversion network and think that it's as flexible as a new network. Flexible is maybe the wrong term, but like, you know, like this optimization gets kind of stuck in this, in this state. It cannot get, it cannot, it cannot reverse it. Um, and that's actually a kind of an important thing to consider when you're training neural networks later on, right? Like you initialize it at the beginning, such that you have no dead reloads and like all the distributions right now are fulfilled. We're going to talk about this in a second. Um, but then once you optimize it, like then you cannot revert the process. It's kind of like it's converging, you're going down and hopefully at the end, you're going to get a nice result. This is how this optimization with the SGD and these nonlinearities goes. Now, let's talk a little bit about the initialization um, because that, that's here very critical actually, right? So here the problem is this dead reload issue is we would love to make sure at the beginning that we're not ending up in this dead reload. And the way you do this is you just think about it. Well, you initialize the real neurons with slightly positive biases, right? So for instance, 0.01 or something like this. And that means they're going to stay active for most of the parts, right? And this is a nice trick um, that you can use to make the real networks actually work pretty well in practice. Okay. Um, there's a few other tricks we can do though. There's also the tricks of using leaky reloads. So leaky reload means, well, don't, don't die off all the way. Um, so you're just having a small factor here. So 0.01 times X on this side. So you have different slopes here, basically. Um, and the advantage of this dead, of this leaky reload is you don't have this dead reload issues anymore. Um, and in fact, these leaky reloads are actually being used quite often. Like a lot of state-of-the-art networks use either relu or leaky relu. This is a bit of a spoiler, um, but these are the, the functions that are often being used. So leaky relu is definitely a viable alternative depending a bit on the setting. For instance, like generative adversarial networks often use leaky relus. Um, also large, larger confidence use it as well sometimes. Okay. Um, Another concept is parametric reload. So instead of having a fixed function here, you can get a, a parameter alpha here that learns the slope here. Uh, that one is kind of nice because it learns the slope here as well. So this is kind of cute. So it doesn't die either. Uh, there's a little downside of this parametric reload, which is you have to have one more parameter to backprop into, right? So you're adding basically more and more parameters in the activations. And there's a pro and a con. This is a very high level um, question here. Do we rather want to have simple activations and then stack more layers or possibly more neurons? Or do we want to have each layer or each neuron to be more powerful and learn more per neuron? And the trend with reloads is clearly saying like, make it as that simple as you can, stack as many layers as you can, and that gets you better results in the long run. And yeah, that, that, that's what people are doing there. Um, there's another extreme version of this um, going the other way and saying like, let's make the, the, the network layers more, or the neurons more powerful, the activations more powerful. These are these max out functions. So max out functions, um, they're basically doing like this, this triangle thing here. So max out units, what they do is they say you have two set of weights, a set of W1 and a set of W2. You have W1 times X plus bias, W2 times X plus bias, and take the maximum of the two, right? So you just kind of like you, you're making your neuron twice as large. Um, you don't die off and you have different slopes in a sense, or you have different functions for each of the parts respectively. Um, which is very nice from property perspective, but you're doubling the parameters, right? So the downside here is like, okay, well, I need twice as many, uh, twice as many parameters um, to get certain output here. Um, and as I said already, like the trend currently was more to go to a, to a simple one. Now, these max out units though, they can be even more generalized. 
So this is the relo. This is this max out units that we just had. And you can even go higher dimensional right now. You can say it's a piecewise linear approximation of convex functions of n pieces. Like think about all of these lines here, right? Like this one, this one, this one, this one, and this one. So if you go to k equal to five here, uh, you can actually go um, and approximate pretty much a quadratic function, right? So what does it mean? Well, you know, depending on where you are in the function, you're just taking one of the slopes respectively and you're approximating this quadratic function with five different linear pieces in this case, k equal to five, right? So the, the relo has two, the this, this standard max out has also two, but you can go up to, to higher values here, right? So you can do that. Um, so the max out neuron therefore enjoys the benefits of a relo in the linear regime, no saturation, and doesn't have its drawbacks like dying relos. Now, unfortunately the problem, right, is like we just adding with every k segment here we're adding another um yeah another set of parameters that we need right and that that as i said like it's an interesting concept but it's not something that people use uh in practice right so generalization of relu linear regimes doesn't die and doesn't saturate but has a lot of parameters at the end um but i think it's still important to understand right that you can go ahead and take piecewise approximations for a function and um, yeah, and, and, and just get away and, and try to get away from these limitations that the simpler functions have. So yeah, I mean, here's a bunch of plots here, right? Um, linear, step functions, sigmoids, 10H, relo, leaky relo, and so on, right? Um, so this is the plot of this function. Um, if we're summarizing the whole thing for a sec, the sigmoid and the 10H, they have been used in the 90s, 80s, early 2000s, I'd say. But that, at the moment, I would say they're not really used that much anymore for feedforward nets. For standard feedforward MLPs, it's rare that you would use them. Um, the relo is still the standard choice. Um, the second choice would be variants of relo. Like, I mean, leaky relo is actually being used um, quite a bit, to be honest. That's probably the one. Max out right now, not that much, and so on. Later on, we're going to talk about other things like sigmoids, 10Hs, stuff like that, right? This is still a thing that we have to, we have to, um, we have to talk about. Um, yeah, the other thing I still want to talk about, one thing that is actually important. So when you're talking about like sigmoids and 10Hs, sigmoids, of course, we saw it in the binary cross entropy, we still have that function. So often when you do regression, you still want to have that in the output function to force a certain output, right? Sometimes the last layer is still a sigmoid or a 10H, depending on, on what problem statement you're dealing with. Now, be careful with that though, right? Like, like if you're taking a sigmoid, the output is, is not uniformly distributed along the range. In fact, like 1.0 can never be reached, right? You need an infinitely large function. Like zero can also not be reached. Same thing, you need an infinitely negative input, basically. Um, and this is the problem with, with a little bit sometimes when you're using them as outputs, like you're changing the distribution, it's not a uniform distribution, and you're also changing very simple things like parameter ranges. Like, um, I mean, stuff that's often funny is like people want to predict image values, right? So for every image, they want to normalize it and make sure they make a color prediction. Um, and then they, you know, they accidentally just predict half of the possible color values and stuff like this. Um, so it's very important to understand what the respective parameter range is. And the output ranges are from these activation functions when you use them. Okay, anyway, quick guide, quick summary. For the most part, relu is the standard choice for the most part um, for all standard stuff. There's going to be later things, maybe like neural fields or so we're going to talk about. There's other type of functions that people are using there. But that's not what we're talking about right now. For, for us, our simple learning-based functions, um, uh, we're going to use mostly relu. Right? And maybe, maybe leaky relu. Okay, let's talk a bit about weight initialization. Weight initialization is very critical, as I said. Um, for like 10H and sigmoid, this was kind of a nightmare. Now it gets a little bit easier, but there's still a few things we actually have to, we have to still consider here. So where do we start? Well, obviously how we start is kind of important, right? Like we talked about the initialization is critical, right? In a, in a, in a gradient descent solver. But the reason why it's so critical here is not necessarily just to end up in a local minimum. 
the reason why it's important for a neural network for the most part is actually such that we're getting good gradients. And good gradients means that we're moving in the training sets. The local minima, this is an, it's an interesting question. A lot of people analyze this, but the argument is in a large neural network, many local minima achieve a similar performance. So in other words, if the dimensionality of the network is large enough, you might always still converge to something that is reasonable, irrespective of which exact local minima it is. But the problem is often when you're starting optimization is to reach a local minima to begin with. And that's what we're dealing with right now, right? Um, basically what happens to gradients, right? What happens to gradients? So let's take a couple of things. Let's, let's just think about a bunch of stuff. What if we're initializing all the weights with zero? If all my weights are zero, how do my gradients look like? Well, what's going to happen there is, okay, I'm taking, I'm, I'm, no matter what's going to happen is, uh, all my input is going to be zeroed out and I'm adding a bias to it, right? So all my hidden units are all going to compute the same function. The gradient is also going to be the same everywhere. And there's no such thing as symmetry breaking meaning that it doesn't know where to change the weights of which neuron. Like everything is the same, right? Nothing changes. So it's kind of this perfect balance. Yeah, in practice, that doesn't happen so often. And the reason why that doesn't happen so often is um, you're going to deal with... So one thing, actually, I should have... Maybe we should do this at some point. But um, the one thing you still have to consider, we're not dealing with perfect numbers here. We're dealing with flowing point numbers. Uh, and there's sometimes a bunch of symmetry breaking still happening. But it's a bit complicated. Um, but the point is, if my gradients are all going to be zero, I'm going to produce always the same thing. So my gradient of changing it is, is, is in the balance. So it doesn't change. Even if it changes a little bit, it's still barely changing. So what are the alternatives? Well, I can go ahead and just initialize the whole thing with, with small random numbers. Um, and a good idea here is um, to start with, with a Gaussian distribution. Right? I just sample from a Gaussian distribution with um, the mean to be zero, right? That makes kind of sense. So I want to have a mean centered uh, distribution. Um, and when I say small numbers, I said, for instance, the standard deviation to something like 0 0.01, right? That's pretty small. So let's see what happens. If I have a network with 10 layers and 500 neurons, we're using 10H activation functions, and the input is just some random Gaussian data. And now what you can do is you can just go ahead and plot the respective outputs. So these are the activations. Um, if I'm using 10 as activations, you have these small random numbers as initializations. Well, this is our first layer. This is our input, how it looks like. And we're seeing that basically this function becomes tinier and tinier, right? So my output basically goes to zero as we continue. Well, why is that happening? Well, um, we have to look at our 10 h function. If you're looking at our 10h function here, we will see if I have small values here, then I'm in the middle here. Um, so this here will be very different. So small w's cause also small outputs. Like the extreme cases, if I have zero w's, right, then I get zero everywhere. If they're small, they're still going to be very tiny uh, and they're going to cause small outputs. And this is what happens, right? So basically my layer mean, if I'm plotting the mean here per layer in the outputs, it's pretty much close to zero when my numbers are also to zero. Yeah, so yeah, if my weights are zero, then the outputs are also going to be approximately zero. Um, so this little issue is now each activation functions gradients is okay, but we still have a vanishing gradient caused by the small outputs because my outputs generally are so small, right? Um, so yeah, so the small output of layer L, the input of layer L plus one causes a small gradient with respect to the layers. And that's of course not ideal. And the reason why that happens is because, um, yeah, our initialization was very, very small. Now, small outputs, so small random numbers, they don't work. Um, let's try big random numbers. Like, let's do the same thing. Let's say we have a Gaussian distribution with zero mean and standard deviation of one now. Before we had 0.01, now we have one. Let's see what happens again. Let's plot our activations. Um, we still have a network of 10 layers, 500 neurons, 10 H's activation functions, input unit is Gaussian. 
um, we're going to get stuff like this now. Well, what does that mean? Well, since we have large weights, what's going to happen is uh, we have this 10H, right? It's going to be either all the way to the right or all the way to the left. Either it's going to be minus one or one, right? So again, like 10H function, either we're going to be here or we're going to be here. Now, this is funny um, that also in this case, of course, our gradients are going to be zero because we're here and here respectively, right? So we still have vanishing gradients now. We This time, it's not big. It's not because our function itself, the values were small, but it's caused by the saturation of the activation function. I should say, in fairness, this problem you don't have that much with ReLU, right? The other problem you have also with ReLU. The small number problem is the same issue. Um, but this one, basically, you're not going to have uh, with ReLU that much. Okay, but how do we solve it? Well, I mean, the pr obviously now the challenge is we have to find a balance, right? It, it can't be too small, but it can't be too large either, right? That's the whole point. So let's work on the initialization. Um, and let's work on the output generated by each layer. So we have to make sure that what we would like to do is we would like to enforce a certain output distribution. And this is what's called a Javier initialization. So the Gaussian with mean zero. Now the question is, what kind of standard deviation do we have to choose such that we're getting ideally the input and output should be roughly the same? That's actually what we care about in terms of a distribution. We, do, we don't want to shift out of the distribution around. So, right, this is what we would like to do, actually. We would like to make sure that the variance of this distribution of our scores um, is, is roughly between the input and the output similar. And the way that we do that now is we say, well, the variance of our score is nothing else but the variance of our layer that we had, right? And then it's the variance of the weights times our axis. So our inputs times our weights. So now... Notice the number of input neurons of the layer of weights you want to initialize um, is this n here, right? This is going over all our neurons because we're summing the whole thing up now when we're, when we're adding all of them up together. And now what we can do is we can actually reformulate this whole thing. Now, if you're taking a random variable, so we take the expected value of a variable of x squared, this is actually equal to the variance of x plus the expectation of x squared. Right? Um, so if X and Y are independent, we can basically rewrite the variance like this, right? So the variance is nothing else but X times of two random variables, right? Of X times Y is equal to expected value of X times the expected value of Y. So if you have these two random variables. And with these, with these little tricks here, what we can do is we can rewrite this variance here, right? Um, and that's what we do here. We just want to rewrite this part here Right? So this part here is basically just putting into this formula here. Um, and then we're rewriting it. And then what we're getting is because basically we want to make sure that this is zero mean and this is also the zero mean. Uh, then we can actually get to something that looks like that. We see here variance of X times variance of W, right? These are our two inputs. And then we can basically, we move this N here out. So this is an identical distribution. Each random variable has the same distribution. And we move this n here out. This is basically the number of neurons. And what we can see now is already this n will be important in how we do the initialization. So how many neurons we have per layer will depend on how we have to initialize a layer. Because how many things you're summing up after you're running stuff through a neuron depends on how large the output value is going to be. And as I said, the goal here is that the, the distribution from the scores and from the input should be roughly the same. So we don't want to change it. Um, and now we're just feeding this into this into this formula what we just had. So we have n times variance of w times variance of x. And we want to make sure that this is equal to x, right? That means that this one should be roughly here equal to 1. And now what we know what to do. Because now what we know what to do is we need to know how do we need to set the variance of our w's. That's the whole point what we care about. We care about how do we set the right variance of our w's. Well, n is fixed, that's the number of neurons, and the variance of the w's, we know that this term here should be one because we want to make sure this is equal. Uh, then we know that we need to set our variance to one over n. And it kind of makes intuitively sense, right? If you have more, more neurons in a, in a layer, um, then the, you have more elements in the sum to sum this stuff up. That means we have to initialize the weights to a little bit of a smaller value the more we have. 
And so the variance here of the, of the weights should be one over n. And that's what we do. So now we do a Harvey initialization. And Harvey initialization says variance of w should be one over n. And if we're doing it, the same thing with 10h functions, we're gonna get something like this. And why is that good now? Now, if you look, this one stays mostly the same here. This is great, right? So we don't collapse to one or the other, but we have a good Gaussian distribution pretty much at every layer. And that's exactly what we care about. And this is why this works so well. Now, it works so well, um, but we did use the 10H activations. So now the question is, how does this look like with uh, Relos? So historically speaking, what people have done is, right, they use 10H networks, they try to find a good initialization with 10H networks, they use initialization like this one, um, and now they have to adapt it to, to Relos. Uh, when you do this with Relos, it doesn't work that well. Um, when you do Harvey initialization with Relos, you're going to have this little issue <laughs> that every time you run this through, you're, you're kind of like halving your distribution almost, right? Uh, the reason why that happens is very simple. Um, the output here is simply close to zero again because you have this maximum function in the middle. You're kind of losing half of the distribution. And so we have to fix that. And the way we're fixing that is we don't want to kill half of our of our data, basically. Well, Relo kills half of our data, so we have to make sure we don't kill half of our data. Well, and mathematically speaking, the way you fix it is you just literally multiply the whole thing by two. Why do you multiply it by two? Well, it's simple because the Relo kills half of your data. Literally, it's a maximum that is half of the function. If you have a perfect Gaussian distribution, half of it goes through and the other one doesn't go through, right? And now what we need to make sure is we have to, in the expected value that we're getting as an output, we have to correct for this factor of two. And this factor of two, we just initializes with two times the variance, right? So basically, we are artificially making our values two times larger, but because half of them get killed with ReLU, because of the Gaussian distribution, um, this one maintains the distribution then over time, right? So it doesn't change it over time. Right? So it roughly stays the same. So input and output roughly stays the same. And this is called a Kaiming initialization. It's kind of this variant of, of this Harvey initialization uh, where you simply have this little factor of two. But for the realist, it makes a big difference. It's actually very logical, right? Like you're killing half of the stuff. You need to multiply it by two to make sure the distribution stays the same. Um, and that's, that's how we go. And this stuff makes actually a big difference. So this is Relo using, I mean, this Kaiming initialization is also called Harvey times have you two initialization, right? Um, but this is basically what you're getting here. This makes a huge difference. If you're taking basically the standard Harvey, which is this one, and then you're dividing it, we have this variance times two, then you're getting this one here. You see that the epochs here, the arrow goes actually down quite a bit more. Um, and this is really critical to get stuff to work. If you're initializing the weights wrong, then nothing changes because you just don't get a gradient. Um, and this is, I think, a really good summary, right? I mean, again, the high-level goal, what we're doing here is we need a good, good gradients so we can converge in our neural networks such that we can fit the training set very well to our, to our respective function. Okay, let's do a quick summary here. Um, so summary right now, what we have done today is, is quite a bunch of stuff, actually. So we've talked about losses and we've talked about activations and we've talked about initializations. So... Then we're talking about image classification. We have binary classification and multi-class classification, right? We talked about the binary cross entropy, which is the sigmoid in the output, or we have a softmax in the output, which is then leading to the softmax, uh, which is then leading to the cross entropy loss, right? Binary cross entropy and the standard cross entropy, right? Um, so this is the output layer and this is the loss function then respectively. That's what we talked about. Uh, we talked about other losses that such as SVM loss, um, Practically, most people don't use SVM losses. The reason why we in introduced it here is for you to have an understanding how loss functions work um, and to have an understanding why the binary cross entropy loss is so useful. And we talked a little bit about the activations then afterwards, and we talked about how we initialize the optimization um, and set the weights accordingly such that the distrib... Again, initialization of weights is also very straightforward. The whole thing what we care about here is we want to make sure that distribution doesn't change between layers, right? If you have 100 layers and the distribution has a bias, meaning that every time you're killing half of your distribution, you're not going to converge to anything because your gradient is going to be zero out. Uh, so you have to maintain your distribution. And this is like Relo, right? This Harvey divided by two. 
uh, is very obvious here because that really looks close half of the expected value. Um, and because of that, I need to have this factor of two. Okay, I think that's pretty awesome. Um, with this one, you can actually train MLPs now pretty well. You can actually train relatively large MLPs and do actually quite some stuff with it. Okay, in the next lecture, we'll talk about more about training neural networks. We talk about more regularization, um, things like augmentation, batch normalization, stuff like that. And later, we're going to talk about convolutional neural networks. That's, a, you know, like, and then we talk about more architectures. We're going to talk about how to bring a bit more structure to the MLPs, basically. That, that's one thing that we haven't really touched yet. So, yeah, I, I hope you enjoyed it. Um, I think we've, we've made a good solid progress here. Um, I hope you you can still follow all the content. I'm, I'm trying to, to keep still a, a, a good pace here. Um, and now I think hopefully you enjoy training your, your networks already yourself because now I think the basic stuff you should actually know already. Um, yeah, with that, thanks a lot for, for joining. Um, and I hope, I hope you come back. Um, see you everybody next week. See you. Bye-bye.